EcoBoost versus EcoBoost. Which Ford F-150 engine delivers the goods? We also talk about a problem with our Tesla P85D, next on Talking Cars. Hi there, and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm Gabe Shenhar. On this episode, we're going to touch on a few topics that have been floating around here. We're also going to get to a bunch of reader questions. First, we've been testing the new Ford F-150. We bought a pair of them, both with EcoBoost engines, one with the 3.5 and one with the smaller 2.7 liter. And something rather interesting came out of our acceleration test, didn't it, Gabe? Yes, the 2.7 is actually faster than the 3.5. It accelerates to 60 in uh, 7 seconds flat, uh, which is a couple of um, clicks faster than the 3.5. And this is kind of a surprise, yeah, obviously, because I mean, you think 2.7 liters hauling around a big truck you know, like the one parked behind us. Well, there's a lot of naysayers when we even tested the 3.5 V6, right, with the, the first EcoBoost, mm -hmm. which, which was right there with the, the big V8. Um, but yeah, 2.7, it's a pretty small displacement for a big truck like this. Um, but yeah, there's a whole lot more to that story. And uh, one piece is, obviously a lot of people know the thing's aluminum, so it's lighter than the other trucks. Um, and comparing the 2.7 to 3.5, we're not saying that 2.7 has more power than the 3.5, the, the axle ratios are different too. So with the axle ratio on this 2.7, it's different from the 3.5, so it's more geared for quicker acceleration. And it could get by with that because it is that smaller displacement, so you're not being penalized by the fuel economy, so it still gets better fuel economy than 3.5. Right. And that's the way they're equipping them. It's yeah, not I mean, that's yeah. our choice. No, we bought fairly right. typically equipped trucks. Yeah. Our, the 2.7 had a 355 rear, the um, 3.5 had a 331 rear. But one, one thing I want to point out, too, is that you know, it's not just um, you know, the Ford race here between the two Ford engines. Actually, if you compare it to the, the Hemi Ram and the Silverado that we mm -hmm. tested, the two sevens even faster than those. Right. It's also getting better fuel economy, because we got 17 miles per gallon out of the two seven, which it tops the pickup truck class. It does. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, gasoline, I, not diesel. Right, exactly. I mean, the Ram diesel gets 20, and 17 is, is pretty commendable. You'd expect that from a, from a you know, mid-sized pickup truck. What do they right. call them now? Small uh, pickup trucks. Uh, I, I hate Colorado, calling them small. The Coma, they yeah. call them Colorado. <laughs> they're called <laughs> yeah, exactly. Colorado, right. But they're not really small anymore. No, no more Mazda B2000s. OK, so this raises two questions. One, if you were going to buy an F-150, what engine would you get? What engine should, is there an engine most people should get? Well, uh, okay, it's not all great stuff with the 2.7. Mm -hmm. The towing capacity is not right. there. Right. So, um, and, you know, we've talked about this before. I mean, you know, in another life, I actually worked on powertrain cooling. Little people, few people know this. But, I mean, in terms of power, powertrain. A glamorous, a glamorous It profession. was very <laughs> exciting, I tell you that. Well, lots of trips out to the desert, so that was kind of fun. But here's the thing. Um, in terms of really setting towing capacity, it really is a lot more to do with can you cool off the engine than can the engine have enough power. I mean, mm -hmm. with the 2.7, you're still over 300 horsepower. You've got enough power to do that towing, but the way they're equipping this thing, it, it, it's the, the, the towing capacity right. is what? What's the 3,000 pounds? Yeah, or so I mean, yeah, th yeah. Um, the truck behind us will tow, um, you know, which is a 4x4 four four Super Crew 145 inch wheelbase. What would be a test on this? for the audience. <laughs> I really hope not. Oh, Pop quiz. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so many numbers. Uh, it will tow 7,600 pounds. It can top out around 8,200 when you change, you know, picking different axle ratios. The 3.5 liter Oka Boost will tow 10,700 pounds. It will top out 11,800. So, I mean, you've got, you have 3,000 pounds more capacity. Yeah. But, like you said, I've really got to wonder, if you just put bigger coolers on the 2.7, or if Ford had wanted to put bigger right. coolers on the 2.7, they <clears throat> probably could have gotten the range. Yeah, I mean, you go to Europe high. and they have like golfs with 5,000 pound towing capacities yeah. because they got big, big powertrain cooling. But, um, but regardless of that, I mean, if you don't need that big towing capacity, I mean, 7,600, I mean, that's... 7,600 is still plenty. It's a 25-foot Airstream. I mean, sure, that sure. thing tows my trailer, no problem. I mean, actually, you look at, you know, 1500 series, you know, these big types of pickup trucks, that's a, that's a decent amount for five years ago. That's what right. most of them are doing. Now they're all kind of getting the bragging rights of going to 10,000. So if you don't need that towing capacity, the 2.7 is going to be fine. Right. The other question I have is this. Is this the first time EcoBoost actually proves to be worthwhile. I mean, we've knocked EcoBoost a lot for not really measuring up. Does it measure up here? 
Well, in fuel economy, we've knocked them for not measuring up. Uh, the performance uh, aspect, uh, that's been more or less delivered. Uh, I'm, I'm going to whine on that one. Because, yeah. I mean, when you look at the Fusion, I mean, with that... Yeah, compared to a V6. Yeah, so the yeah, Fusion yeah, right. 2 liter compared yeah. to most competitive yeah, right. well, 3.5s. Keep going. What about Fusion, right. uh, the 1.5 turbo, compared to most competitive four-cylinder 2.5s and 2.4s? I mean, uh, the Escape is not the Escape. Look at the Escape. Escape. Yeah. So, but anyway, I mean, both of these engines, I mean, if you're not uh, interested in the ultimate towing, they really provide a very nice driving experience. I mean, very effortless, very quiet, uh, and... Uh, I've, I've, I've got to argue on, again on this one. That's okay. Gonna... I mean... It's, it's, <laughs> but I, I think you're, anyone you put in the 3.5 or the 2.7 is going to say, apart from the sound, it's... Got the well, grunt you, and the, you hear next to nothing. Yes, well, but, and this is if we're about compared that. to a V8. Yeah, it's it has the torque. It has uh, anything you want to do with it. You're frustrating deliver. Jake, who <laughs> wants to trounce you. Go, Jake, go. I agree with Gabe. That's what I was going to say. No, <laughs> no, um, no. You're right. They're quiet. No, you're They're right. Silky. Or yes, you're wrong. You. That too. <laughs> Just answer. They're quiet. <laughs> They're silky. They're smooth. That's right. Part of me, though, is like, if I'm going to get a big truck that, you know, with that big, I really like the sound of the Hemi. Mm. I really like the sound of a big V8. And I don't know if, if for a truck buyer, is that really, really a plus, that you don't have that big V8 burble. You know, I mean, when we did last generation F-150, right. I mean, we, we, we argued yeah. about this too. We do. Oh, you could we get do. the 3.5 and you could get the V8. And you can still get the 5 liter V8. You can still get the 5 liter yeah. V8. And we saw what? Very similar fuel economy, very mm -hmm. similar performance. But, but for me, uh, the big burble, the V8, that seems to suit the, suit the truck. Okay, man. I mean, that, but that's a total taste thing that you, you totally. like that. I mean, mm -hmm. totally. that Ram, the Ram is pretty much as, actually zero to 60 times are almost identical with mm -hmm. the 2.7 and the Ram. Uh, the Ram's getting two miles per gallon less. But, but it sounds good. No. But, <laughs> but, and, and, and gas what, is cheap right and now. And gas is cheap, hey, because the report says just leave it all up. No, 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 no. No, but, but, there's another, another, another piece of the story where we talked before. Is it because of the Hemi or is it because the Ram weighs another 500 pounds? Because of aluminum. So yeah. aluminum, look mm -hmm. at you. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, with the aluminum. So if you had aluminum, ram, you know, we should do that. We should take our Ram and we should just kind of like, you know, cut 500 pounds out of it. Well, I mean, actually, <laughs> see what it does. We and didn't have, but we didn't, you know what? We didn't have to do that because we had a printer. <clears throat> wow. you, you, you handle that project. <laughs> um, we didn't have to do that because we tested the 2011 F-150, which was 700 pounds more than the 2015. We tested them both with the 3.5 mm -hmm. liter EcoBoost. Uh, and that 700 pounds weight savings saved us one mile per gallon. Because it went from 15 to 16. Okay, so with the three five. So okay, so we you know, get I mean, mile per gallon maybe out of the uh, the Hemi. If, uh, they lightweighted it. Yeah, maybe. So you'd get the 16, which is right where the Silverado mm -hmm. is sitting. Right, and I which mean, is I, right where the three five is. But yeah. it all comes say, together. <laughs> the Silverado feels underpowered. It does. But yeah. but that's throttle response. It's transmission mapping. Well, it, yeah. Whatever it is, it's part it, of. What I feel. No, no. <laughs> and you're right, you're right. Yeah. It does have that feel, mm -hmm. which is actually interesting. I was driving to Colorado last night. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey. Um, but, but the Colorado, they seem to completely about face. So the Colorado, like all the acceleration is like right at the top. And there's mm. a few times I was going to like jerk in the thing, you know, because it's. Gas prices came down. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are, we're wrapping up testing on those and we'll let you know soon how the uh, F-150 compares to the Ram, compares to the Silverado in overall score. Going a completely different direction, um, something broke on our Tesla Model S P85D after, what, three weeks and 2,000 miles? Yes. What happened? Um, it was the driver's door handle. So they have the electric, uh, electric things where they come out and present. It's just so gimmicky. I mean, there's so much on that car that's like, oh, that really. But I showed nice. that car to people, and they're like, wow, look at the door. And then it didn't work. It's I'm like, oh, come on. Light, yeah. I guess it is, but it, it's a bit gimmicky. And and yeah, it stopped presenting itself, so you couldn't actually get into the car. I mean, I guess you could go around the other side, but then the thing doesn't want to start because there's a whole sequence of mm -hmm. the door opening and. So yeah, it was a real kind of pain for us, and um, you know, it wasn't a pain to get it fixed. Well, it wasn't a pain to get it fixed. I mean, fortunately, uh, Tesla they do house calls, and they don't do just house calls for consumer reports. They do it for everybody because they don't have all the extensive dealer network. They actually send 
They sent a guy out. Hopefully it's not the same guy throughout the country. But Although that guy, he watches talking cars. Yes. So that's awesome. <clears throat> yes, it was a very nice guy. He was a nice guy. He, he was actually, actually, that's true. I mean, he was really nice. He knew what he was doing. He got there and was able to fix the car right as we waited um, at our place. And, and they'll do it with customers, which is kind of nice. But what was interesting about the door handles, we went back again and looking through our data. There's a reason they know how to fix the door handles. This is the number one complaint that yep. we had. So we have you know, a million people in our, on our uh, survey uh, that we did of uh, cars. Um, in terms of reliability, um, about 1,300 of them were Tesla Model S's, and the number one complaint, lo and behold, door handles. The door handles. Was it? Was it not the power power train? No, not the battery. Not the batteries. No. Not all the scary new whiz bang stuff. Not the, the touch handles. screen. Yeah, door handles. Uh, so yeah, it's fixed. Uh, we're still testing it, still having fun with it. We're gonna we're gonna put out uh, test results on that as we continue to test it. So that mm -hmm. that would be cool. Uh, now getting to questions. There is actually a segue between the Tesla and this question. And I don't mean the two-wheeled segue. It's I mean, electric. I mean, I mean the, the, <laughs> it is electric. Uh, way back at the New York Auto Show, we were talking about. Um, collaborations between manufacturers that weren't really working out to be too reliable. Uh, basically, we're talking about Toyota and Subaru with the um, Scion FRS and the Subaru BRZ. And Jake had wondered, you know, has there ever in history been a collaboration between two major manufacturers that worked out to be reliable? Well, yeah. As Andrew Price works out, he said, uh, you don't have the time to come up with a reliable collaboration. Let go, Tom, and use the manly cognitive power of your beard. <laughs> All three of you were just talking about one, the Matrix. Both it and the Vibe were manufactured at GM Toyota's joint new me facility in California, which now builds. That's a, even a better segue than you thought, huh? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. There we go. It worked yeah. out. So yes, of course, you're right. That in in, in our defense, it was a long day. <laughs> <laughs> um, Car shows yeah. are long days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's absolutely right. Uh, those new me vehicles were great, and there was a whole bunch of. Uh, um, collaborations with uh, Toyota and Chevy. Yeah, I mean, Prisms and Corollas. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so that went back. The viewer is many, completely many right. Years. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, from our uh, episode talking about the Golf R versus the GTI, you missed that one, which is a shame because you yes. do, do love, love, love the GTIs. Uh, <laughs> Jake had made the point that. Um, uh oh. Yeah, this is I, this was is, I this tired is, that day too. All, that's right. We're is, tired is this, every is this, day. Is this the segue? Is this the theme of the <laughs> this, show? This is the where Jake screwed here's, up. Here's <laughs> Jake apologizing for screwing up. Jake had said that he would buy a GTI, and <clears throat> you know, with the money you save from an R, which is going to be about seven thousand dollars, you'd you'd chip it and put sticky summer performance tires on. As somebody points out, CR guys, how could you turn a front-wheel drive GTI into an all-wheel drive R with an aftermarket kit? Major I, surgery. No, no, you can't do that. But, but <laughs> I don't think the all. I, mean, I don't think I. I need the all-wheel drive. I'm yeah, just gonna throw that out. There's, there's a bunch of people who want all-wheel drive because rally, you know, and traction on the track, ultimate traction on the track, mm -hmm. and proportioning to oh, the GTI is great. I prefer it to stay lighter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's something to be said for uh, the all-wheel drive traction on the track, but. You're not driving on a track, and uh, you were just enjoying a GTI. Then the GTI is just is all the fun you need. If you're going on a track, then I don't know if the Golf R is really the right car for you. It wouldn't be my first pick as a well, track. It might be a BMW 228i yeah. with the track package. Yeah, we Did talked about that. That we'd get a three. Most of us would get a three yeah. series. James totally right. Series. If I'm if I'm going on the track, I want rear wheel drive, honestly. Mm. And I mean, and if you're on the road in the snow, all-wheel drive is nice, but with a Golf R, you're going to spend a lot of money to get uh, winter wheels and tires. Yeah, on you're going to need winter tires. To, to get around the brakes. Yeah. So, um, From the show talking about the Jeep Renegade, uh, Bruce Solomon asks, is the Renegade capable of anything that the Fiat 500X isn't? Which is a very clever question. I think that the... F I added that. I think that the 500X's styling is cleaner, especially in the area of the greenhouse. We have just driven a Fiat 500X, and it's, I said it's an interesting question because they're based on the same platform. Yeah, they're sister vehicles. How do they compare, Gabe? Well, the 500X is a little uh, nimbler, and it uh, feels a little tighter, and it, it kind of wraps around you a little more, and it's, it's not as... Uh, the Renegade feels a bit like a tub, intentionally, to right. drive, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the Fiat doesn't come with the, um, what does Jeep call the uh, off-road capable thing? Um, uh, well, I mean, you, you can't get a Trailhawk no, version of it. No, not Trailhawk, but, but <coughs> have, uh, the, the uh, knobs with all the different settings, with, with, with sand, yeah. snow, maw, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. 
Your thoughts on the 500 hex? Yeah, they're different cars. I mean, yes, they're on the same platforms, but that doesn't mean they're the same cars. They, they drive different. They gave so late, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you take the, five, the 500 hex and it drives like a, a car, and the Jeep kind of makes you feel like you're a little bit of a Jeep. And I think in terms of capabilities, uh, if you wanted to go off-road, not that they're going to do with either one of them, they have very different personalities. They're not twins by any stretch no. of the imagination. I do think, though, the 500X is going to become a uh, sort of an answer to a trivia question. You know, because, I mean, that's not a big semi. The Nissan Juke, Mini Countryman, those sorts mm -hmm. of cars, yeah. they don't sell in big numbers here. And Fiat, I think Fiat's a tough sell. I, I, they're I rebuilding that agree. brand. I so. mean, I mean w as soon as I drove the, the Renegade, I'm like, oh my God, they're going to sell every one of these that they're going to make. Mm -hmm. um, didn't really feel that with the 500X. It's no. a very niche. Yeah, niche car. very niche vehicle. Another niche vehicle is the Acura ILX, and we've made people angry. You know, sometimes I, I read the comments that are on YouTube, and I really think that it's like social media consultants just trying to blast us to, to you know, arguing for car companies. Here's an example. <laughs> Consumer Reports, please address this, please, is in all caps. How come I haven't seen a single, in all caps, other review of the ILX that has said anything close to what you guys are saying? It is truly night and day. Motor Trend, Car and Driver, Kelly, Blue Book, Edmonds, all of them rave about the sportiness, in caps. Reasonable pricing, in caps. And nice interior, in caps. I have mentioned so many trusted resources for automotive acclaim, all of which sum up the ILX to be an extremely well-rounded package. Why then is Consumer Reports so in caps? Oh, uh, uh, opposite to this view. Well, we're completely so, uh, wrong. I got, no, I no, guess. no. This is this is this is simple. I mean, who says unanimity of opinion is a good thing? Well, well, I I I, I don't know if we're unanimous. We're not unanimous on opinion. Okay, here here is the phone call I've never gotten. Um, Jake, can you kind of tone down what you're talking about, the ILX, because, you know, we get a lot of advertising money for uh, Acura, and we're concerned about that. Here's part two of the phone call you didn't get. Don't you remember when you were out in Napa Valley with us at the Long Lake <laughs> presentation, and you said nice things there? Yeah. Well, that too. I mean, you look, you look around, and <clears throat> all of these outlets, um, they're all dated February 10th, Napa Valley. There hasn't been a real test, a real review yeah, on, on actual public roads that, uh, that were chosen by the reviewer. So uh, right. but these are, these are uh, press events that are with roads that are chosen by the PR department of Honda. And, um, and, and I will say this, I mean, some of these outlets you just mentioned, if you read between the lines, yeah. I mean, there is mention of, uh, yeah, the resuspension crashes. And, yeah, and, uh, there's some rounding up going on yeah. here about raving about I, I mean, I mean, look, I, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, the, you know, the outlets you mentioned, there's some very good reviewers. Sure. There's some really, really good people there. Um, but they're just under pressure that we don't have. Right. You know, I mean, it's just, it's not fair. I mean, we, we don't have to worry about the next trip to, uh, you know, Hawaii for the thing, because we're not going anywhere. No, and I mean, that's their job. You that's know, their job. The only job. way they're going to get access to that car is to get on that plane, which right, is paid for right. by someone else to go and, to and, and, and we don't have people saying, you know, no, worrying the, about the advertising money. The, the, so. way, the, way we, the way we wrote about the Acura ILX is we went out and we spent $30,000 to buy an Acura ILX. And, you know, I, I got to say, excuse the little rant, that's what bothers me. Trusted resources for automotive acclaim I don't want automotive acclaim when I'm about to spend $30,000. I want someone to tell me if I should spend $30,000 on that car or not. And if you're buying an, I, uh, an Acura ILX, no, you should not spend $30,000 on that car. And we can tell you that because we, hey, we spent $30,000. <laughs> uh, let's help someone buy a car. Me and my wife are looking to buy our first car. It's us, a baby seat, and a dog. We are thinking small SUV or maybe a midsize sedan. It needs to be safe, reliable, efficient, under 25 grand. We consider the Santa Fe Sport and Mazda CX-5. I don't want a CVT. I'm one of the few people who enjoys driving. So fun to drive would be nice. Under 25 grand family car. CX-5 sounds like a great choice. I mean, if, mm -hmm. you, if you, you, know, you had me at fun to drive, I, I care about driving, I don't want a CF, CVT. I mean, that, that's a really nice package. Yeah. Yeah. Is a RAV4 fun enough to drive for this guy? I know you, you, we disagree on this. You think it's pretty nimble. I'm kind of yeah, bored by it. It, but. it could be. I mean, there, but um, in, in terms of handling, I think the CX-5 is, is nimbler uh, in, on an everyday road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. CX-5, you know, as we've discussed on other shows, CX-5 is great. Yeah, the, the RAV4 has a little bit of a more spirited powertrain than the CX-5. Well, I mean, the, the 2.5 two is pretty good in the CX-5. Yeah. Well, transmission is a little, little quicker responding. Mm. Uh, another question about, another comment about Mazda. Uh, in a car we haven't talked about, I don't think ever, on Talking Cars, 
You three nailed what Mazda's all about. We are in the market for a large crossover. One drive in the CX-9 and I was sold. No other large crossover except Porsche can hold a candle to its driving dynamics and the unique, not me too looks that sold my wife. Your podcast format just convinced me to renew my subscription. So thank you for renewing your subscription. The CX-9 is a very, is an interesting car. Mm-hmm. I, think, I, think, I think you've mentioned the CX-9 in the podcast before, actually. <laughs> Have you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know, but maybe. It's totally possible. I mean, it's a nice car. It's, it's, it feels very premium. It's, uh, it's got a nice powertrain. It feels uh, nice inside. It's, it's the quietest Mazda ever. <laughs> it has a real legitimate third row seat mm-hmm. uh, that actual people can, can sit in. But uh, the car is ancient. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's it, uh, it suffers in terms of uh, crash test results. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, yeah. it's a gas hog. Yeah, I mean, it it's basically has an old uh, Ford engine in it, basically, right. which, which has plenty of power, but is not efficient at all. Right. Uh, crash test results, it has the poor and the shallow offset right. tests. Um, I'm a little sensitive to that because the Durango last week scored marginal in the, the offset test, so I'm a little touchy there. <laughs> um, but no, the CX-9 is, is a joy to drive. I mean, mm-hmm. on twisty back roads for as big as that coach is, that is a lot of fun. Yep, I mean, we've talked about it before. I mean, just, you know, that, that Mazda DNA just gets in everywhere, even the big SUV. So it, it's pretty impressive how that thing handles for that size. It is. So, uh, you know, if you treasure that and you're willing to overlook the other things, it's also a deal. I mean, because it's, it's old, it's a little low on content. Uh, they don't sell many of them, so they're certainly willing to wheel and deal. And sure. it's been reliable because they've been building it since. Forever. Since the sun yeah. came up. Yeah. So. <laughs> So there you go. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Talking Cars. We always appreciate you watching and listening, and we love your comments. See you next time.